Hello, Fusion fans. Dr. Matt Moynihan here. I'm going to be giving a talk that I had recently give to a group. Um, so some of this is going to be rehash if you've seen some of my other lectures, but hopefully it'll be useful to you. Um, so I'm going to provide a background to myself, my firm, what resources we provide. Uh, I'm Lately, I've been all about pushing community. So it's been about building tools that everyone can use to understand Fusion since right now the industry is really rate limited by the number of people that actually understand this. And so I'm trying to provide resources for the broader community so that anyone and everyone can pick this field up and evaluate it. Then I'm going to talk about the industry itself, uh, where we are uh, both organizationally, financially, and then technically, where we are, how close we are to net power for various um, sort of technical records. I'm going to talk about industry trends, and then I'm going to dive into the meat of the presentation, which is on Lawson. Um, the Lawson criteria is from 1957. John Lawson was an electrical engineer. He wrote out a power balance for a fusion power plant that uses plasma. So all plasma approaches fall under this criteria. And so I'm going to talk about each term and what it means for what it means for a power plant and how it could be designed. Then I want to talk about hoaxes. Um, some red flags to look for when you're you're talking to fusion startups. This field has a long history. And if we don't learn from history, we're bound to repeat it. And I already see it happening right now with the same ideas coming up again that came up last year, 10 years ago, 25 years ago. They didn't work then. They don't work now. Um, but investors don't know the history. And so they, they fund it anyway. So we're trying to sort of root that out. Education is important across the whole field. And that's what we're trying to do here. And then I'll wrap up with some conclusions. So for those who don't know me, I've been involved in this space for 17 years. I started my PhD in 2006, went through a lot of different um, activities along the way. I was a PhD student. I was a blogger. I was a podcaster. Um, I organized a nuclear fusion shark tank. I was involved in two fusion startups. Um, I'm a member of the Fusion Industry Association. I've written a book on fusion, which is available on Amazon, which I'll talk about. And I was a senior nuclear engineer for the Navy uh, at Bettis. Uh, for those who know, nuclear Bettis is pretty world class. Um, we do all the nuclear subs. And so I have a view to how the conventional nuclear industry works and how fusion will sort of fit in that framework that already exists, the regulatory licensing infrastructure framework. Uh, and um, about five years ago, I started a consulting firm and we offer independent third party assessment of fusion pitches. So we're essentially a gig business. When an investor comes with a, an idea from a startup, I can pull together a team from my network that can red team that proposal and then provide lists of risks, technical risks, scientific risks, business risks. And that gives them a nice guidance on where to put their money. So that's what we help. And we're no conflict of interest, which is important because most of the time when you see a presentation from a fusion startup, it's an organization that's pushing a specific agenda. They want to kind of curve the science, the logic, whatever, to fit their narrative. And so this is third party narrative, which is nice. So as I said, my firm is a fundamentally a gig business. Um, it's drawing from my network. We do a lot of different things. Um, we will red team a proposal. We'll do things like we'll provide introductions. So we'll get you in front of the right person to talk to with that specific domain expertise. So if it's lasers, magnets, targets, walls, um, regulatory, superconductors, uh, first wall type stuff, neutronics modeling, plasma physics, any of those domain expertise, we can get you in front of the right people. Um, we assemble a team. We can field the team with over 100 years of experience, uh, and that's possible. We also offer due diligence. Um, so we it usually comes in the form of a report. So we can write a report. A lot of contracts have been multi-week to multi-month type work. Um, we have a fusion industry snapshot that's a really great uh, document. It's 170 pages. It's got a lot of juicy, great information in it. And we sell that as a standalone product. And then, of course, we've got Fusion's Promise, which is my popular science book that I co-wrote with Fred Bortz um, in Pittsburgh. So the story of that book is we started in 2018 and I had written a report for a consultant and realized that I could turn it into a book, a fusion book and publish the book. And so I started working on it, you know, nights and weekends and on Sundays and Saturdays. 
And I went and found Fred in Pittsburgh. And Fred was this wonderful man who had a second career writing, writing science books for kids. So he had a, he was a published author with experience with dealing with publishers, editors, um, every that whole industry. And so Fred decided to help me. So the two of us worked together, collaborated on the book. My job was to get all the material technically accurate, well organized and together. And then I handed the draft to Fred and Fred took it all the way out to normal plain English. So the I'm really proud of the work. You know, is it a perfect book? No, but it has a lot of great information in it. And it's explained with pictures and illustrations over 250 images, excuse me, 215. Yeah, yeah 250 images are in that book. Um, so images, cartoons, it's a great book. Get a copy. It's $40. It's on Amazon. And then on top of that, we offer joint consulting firms or consulting services with another firm called Fusion Advisory Services. This is an umbrella organization with multiple teams in it. Oxford Sciences, Fusion Energy Insights, uh, Energy for the Common Good, and Woodruff Scientific are all part of this umbrella group. So if we need to expand the team, we've got a ready-made expandable teams available. And I love the team approach to taking on technology. I, I firmly believe that teams will beat individual innovators 100% of the time. And a lot of these fusion startups are solo innovator type firms. You see a lot of that. So go with a team. It's a much better option. All right. So if you don't know already, I've got a great resource called Fusion Masterclass. It's available online. It's built around these learn machine learning and eight hour type courses that you see on YouTube, except this one is for fusion. So it's about eight hours, uh, you know, a set of maybe 10 to 12 lectures, depending on where you draw the line. And they're anywhere from 35 minutes to an hour and they cover different specific topics in fusion. So it's totally revolutionary in terms of framework because most of fusion right now, traditionally it's been explained through the lens of a tokamak or a laser system. This is a more big tent approach. So we've got one, one lecture on lasers, one lecture on, on tokamaks, but then we've got other approaches spelled out here. So it's a great resource, highly recommend it. It's free, it's on YouTube, check it out. You can listen in your car while you're running, at the gym, wherever. It's Fusion Explained for normal people. So, okay, so let's get into it. Um, the, the key points about Private Fusion, first of all, this is a completely new energy source that does not exist yet. I don't want the internet getting mucked up about this. We don't have Fusion Power yet, okay? Um, I believe we're gonna see net power within the next five to 10 years from one of these startups. Uh, net power essentially is the plane taking off the Wright brothers moment. When net power occurs, what happens after that is you get a supplier base uh, companies, you get training firms, you start building an industry, you get the regulatory frameworks, you get the government on board, you get the popular, um, the popular, popular, popular science community, community on board. So the first moment, the first step is the net power step. And I do believe we're going to see that soon um, from one of these companies or maybe several of the companies. Um, but we've been at this 70 years, over 70 years since the, since the early 1950s, the government has funded academic institutions, national labs, and in some, some cases, private companies to look at fusion. And we've sort of tried lots and lots and lots of ideas. We threw everything against the wall to see what sticked. Um, the first product was in 2000. So in 2000, there was a firm called NSD Gradle, which created a commercial product that used fusion in its inner workings. It was a neutron generator. For $300,000, you could buy a this machine that was tabletop that would do fusion, create neutrons, and then you could use the neutrons for some commercial application. So the point there is that we've been moving into commercial, uh, the commercial market for 23 years. Our first product was 23 years ago. Fusion is, is moving into the commercial market. And startups have arisen over the last couple decades. Right now, I mean, there's at least 30 firms. There's probably more since there's a lot of dark horses and stuff that's kept secreted. 
Um, but I mean, of the 30 firms, there's certainly, if it's a horse race, some are further advanced, some are further behind. Some have better technical ideas, some have worse technical ideas, some have more money, some have more people, et cetera. So there's lots of horses in this race. They're all racing towards the same goal. Um, and it's, it's hard to keep a total complete picture on the entire space because it is evolving so quickly. Um, but the, the federal government has noticed this. The U.S. government is now um, calling for the president's budget just called for a billion dollars for fusion, which would be really exciting. It's, an, it's 300, roughly 300 million extra money that can be allocated towards new projects. And the budget called for four centers of excellence in the United States around fusion. And I think this would be great. It would be great foundry for people because right now we're limited by the number of people that actually understand the field. We have more money, more jobs and more startups than we have qualified fusion engineers or fusioneers for the for these jobs. So we need more people trained up. And I will say also that the U.S. is kind of behind Britain in this respect. The United Kingdom has been more aggressive in fusion the last few years. So I'm hoping the U.S. can catch up. And then I can't comment on China, but I'm China is aggressive generally, and they're, they're certainly aggressive in this as well. All right, so let's look at what the current technical records are. The world records are listed here. Um, the first one is the Q record, which is the, the ratio of power into power out, total power out not wall plug. And we're about, we're about a third of the way to net power. That's where we are. That record was set by the Joint European Taurus at the end of 2021. The facility made, I think it was 59 megajoules, although don't quote me on that. And that worked out to roughly one third of net power. So we're about a third of the way there. That's where we are right now. There is a temperature and time record and you can't just do temperature and you can't just do time and then there's both together. So for instance, you can the Tokamak Energy, the startup in England, ran their their high field Tokamak for 29 hours, but it, the temp plasma was very, very cold. Um, they also have a record where they ran for 100 million degrees Kelvin plasma. So they have, they have a high temperature record and a long record, but not both in combination. A good world record for temperature and time was set by the Chinese. They ran the East facility out in China for 17 and a half minutes at 126 million degrees Kelvin. That is an impressive both temperature and time record. And I think that will fall. There's a couple government. So W7X out in Germany is gearing up to try to go to 30 minutes at a high temperature. So we'll see where they get to. And then the straight energy, the straight temperature record is held by um, the JT60 Tokamak out in Japan. Um, that's 522 degrees, 522 million degrees Kelvin. Um, that's the electron temperature. So just a note on temperature records, there's electron temperatures and ion temperatures. Obviously, the electrons are not fusing. The ions are. So when you see a temperature record or a temperature claim, you got to remember that we can get the electrons super, super duper hot, but getting the ions to that temperature is a harder thing to do. Generally, they're two different temperatures and the electrons are usually hotter than the ions. That tends to be what happens. Um, so 522 million is a really high temperature. It was previously TFTR had a 502 million degree run and a five, I want to say 515 million degree run. So Princeton's very, very proud of that. Um, and if you go to Princeton, there's a whole bunch of people there that are super proud of TFTR and how wonderful it was. Well, the record was eclipsed by the Japanese. So, um, And then the ICF shot record is 90,000 shots over 10 hours. Um, if, you're, if you watch Fusion, the biggest news story of the last six months was the ignition on NIF. Um, this made popular, broke into popular culture. It was actually on SNL and 60 Minutes did a piece. The Financial Times did a piece. It was pretty much everywhere back in December. Uh, I think it was the November time frame. Excuse me, the November time frame. Um, but you got to remember that Livermore can only shoot about once a day, about once a day, because it physically takes time for the laser to cool down. When you fire the laser, the energy goes through all the glass and the lenses and everything else, and it heats it up physically. So you have to cool it down. So 
by contrast, the Naval Research Laboratory has a facility where they form the laser beam in a gas, in a gas container compartment. And that has a low heat capacity, so it does not heat up. Fundamentally different set of physics, which allows for high shot rates. So the Navy um, did 90,000 shots over 10 hours because they weren't shooting through lenses and glasses like that. They were shooting through gases. All right. So that's why it's fundamentally different. So that's that's how you that's how you hit high repetition. Now, I want to say that solid block le lensing and solid block lasers could probably hit high rates if you're actively cooling. And there's a whole bunch of people that argue that if you pour, um, you know, gas or coolant or cryogenics or liquid over these lenses or blocks of glass, you can still re reach high rates, high shot rates. And there's some there's a lot of work around that Eli, the Eli uh, five facility beam out in the Czech Republic does active cooling. And so there may be a path there. OK, on top of that, there is also a milestone held, I think, will be held by Shine Medical Technologies. Shine is getting close to getting the first fully licensed fusion fission facility in the United States, um, fully licensed by the nuclear regulatory commission which is exciting but it also demonstrates how terrible the permitting process is for nuclear in this country um and generally it's a terrible issue for most renewable energy projects and and so the economist just did a nice uh, article about this if you're interested permitting is a problem and it's going to stop the green revolution if we don't get it cleaned up so to that effect, the Senate just released this advanced act. Um, it was introduced in the Senate uh, last month around making the nuclear regulatory approach much simpler, especially for fusion and, and small modular reactors, which have totally different technical um, constraints. They're just fundamentally different. They, some of them don't have the accidents that big nuclear power plants do. So they should be regulated differently. Okay, so we, as I said, we've had 70 years of fusion research by the government laboratories, both in the United States and internationally. And a number of authors have tried to bring all of that work into one organized figure that everyone can kind of agree upon. And this figure is from my book. So this is my take on it. Um, I'll just name some of the. So Scott Sue had a great. Um, effort he tried to call he called it the zoology of fusion that was in the early 2000s simon woodruff also did a, a presentation called alternative concepts to tokamax in 2008 and then derek sutherland recently did a nice um, overview of all the fusion approaches this is my take from my book and it's a flow chart that connects all these different ideas into families so we group them into families and then each chapter of the book covers a specific family, the idea, the person, the technology, the history, the technical challenges, where it stands today. Is there a startup taking on this specific idea? So the startups, there's a, probably a good startup in almost every one of these categories or family of fusion approaches. So just to just to go around from the top left down and around, the top left is the pinch family, which is the oldest fusion approach. Pinches have been around. There was the first thing that really worked in 1958. And there's a great startup called Zap Energy and a couple other companies that are in the pinch region. They're looking at ways to squeeze plasma with a plasma with a current down the center. So pinch works by the fundamental pinch. The Z pinch works by passing a current down the center, squeezing material around the outside. Then there's the ICF community down there in, in light blue. There's a whole variety of ICF approaches. Um, which is sort of outside the scope of this lecture. There's a plasma jet converging approach that's pursued at Los Alamos at the plasma liner experiment. Then there's a stellarator approach. There's four different kinds of stellarators depending on the fundamental architecture of them. And then there's a lot of innovation happening in stellarators right now. A number of really cool companies looking at different ways to do stellarators. There's a plasma structures approach. Both Helion and TAE are doing plasma structures. Plasma is a fluid that conducts electricity, which means you can whip it up into smoke ring sheets, whatever, donuts. 
And when you do that, the material is hotter and denser on the inside, which allows you to heat diffusion conditions. You can also manipulate the plasma that way. There's electrostatics, which is fusers, polywells, inertial electrostatics. Fusers are a great technology for high school students. So over 200 teens and teams in North America have built these fuser devices in their homes and garages and gotten fusion that way. I think fusers are a great way for someone starting out to learn the field and learn the physics of plasma. They're just really awesome stuff. And it's, it's a great science experiment, science fair experiment stuff. There's cusps. Cusps haven't traditionally worked as well, but there's a variety of ideas there that have been pursued to varying degrees. Of course, there's tokamaks, which are the worldwide heavyweight. Over 215 tokamaks have been built, planned, or decommissioned. And right now, tokamaks are probably the best chance to get to net power first. But that might not be true because there's a lot of startups that are trying to get there ahead of the two tokamak companies that are dominating the space. And then there's mirrors. Mirrors are a great program um, that was really heavily pursued in the 1970s and 80s in the United States. You know, it was a period when the government really tried. And what happened to the mirror program is really a tragedy. Um, we had a wonderful fusion program with thousands upon thousands of engineers and scientists working on mirrors. And then the federal government just cut the program. And it was a really, really sad day for fusion. And I think right now, a lot of people are looking at mirrors for various applications because they harness this superconducting magnet technology. Okay, so this is a little bit cheeky, I admit, um, but I'm trying to make a point here. The big trend right now in fusion is taking an existing fusion approach and adding a super powerful superconducting magnet to it. OK, this this story has already played out in the tokamak world. Obviously, tokamak energy, Commonwealth were both founded on the premise that if you take this superconducting magnet and add it to a tokamak, you will get a net power reactor. That was the founding assumption of the, the firms. But what people are not thinking about, and I haven't seen much thought about, is what do those magnets do to everything else? Okay. I personally believe that there are other fusion reactors out there, fusion reactor designs out there that will work if you have 20, 30, or stronger Tesla magnets in them. So what does a 20 Tesla mirror machine look like? What does a super powerful magnet do to a plasma jet system or a cusp system or a, pla a pinch system or a stellarator system or a plasma structure system? I don't think these questions have really been answered. And I'll just, just speculate here a little bit. But I think if you, someone, someone in academia needs to do this, they can model these approaches and then on the computer take these approaches up to the high fields and see what happens. I bet you there are regions where they don't work. Um, there's probably regions where they would utterly fail and the structure would not be able to handle the mechanical loading of such a powerful field on the structure. There might even be places where they work great. I mean, the plasma physics might be fantastic when you have a 10 Tesla, 20 Tesla field. I mean, it, it's a magnetized plasma we know will probably will scale up. I mean, that's the fundamentals physics of a tokamak, but what about these other systems? I think this is a big unexplored operating space. The whole industry, the trend across the industry, I think for the next 10 years is gonna be superconductors added to fusion reactor concepts. That's going to be the big trend. So the field of superconductivity and the field of fusion are going to be closely linked together. And I also think that superconductivity and superconducting wire and magnets might be the biggest spin out technology from fusion over the next 20 years. Um, because you can take the powerful magnet and you can put it in a motor, a generator, an MRI machine, a superconducting wire system, an energy storage system. There's a variety of spin-out technologies around HTS that are really exciting, really exciting. All right, so let's change gears for a second. Um, 
for this talk, what I wanted to do was pull out some universal principles and concepts that would apply to a vast set of fusion approaches. Because being a consultant, you see all kinds of stuff. You see general fusions approach versus TAE's approach versus Helion's approach versus whatever. And after you look at a number of these systems, you start to see trends. And one of the universal principles is the power balance, okay? Uh, and that's true for any engineered power plant anywhere, including a fusion power plant. You want to have more power out than you put in. And the, the person who first envisioned this was John Lawson, who wrote a power balance for a fusion reactor. And the reactor that he envisioned was basically the sun in a building, okay? He has a plasma in a, in a com compartment in a power plant. He doesn't know anything specific about the plasma. If it's pinched, if it's squeezed, if it's running in a circle or a donut, like a Stellarator or a Tokamak, if it's in a mirror machine, like a linear machine or a cost system, he just knows I have a plasma in the center of my reactor and all plasmas lose power two different ways they lose power by conduction which is where material is conducted away and as the mass leaves it steals energy from the core of the reactor and it loses power by radiation obviously the sun radiates tons and tons of light uh, and that's a big power loss mechanism and then it also generates fusion through volumetric fusion rates which are controlled by the density the temperature the time the chain reaction and the volume and then finally the whole thing has an efficiency because all power plants have some efficiency. So to get to net power, you have to make this expression positive. And no one's been able to do it, not ever, not in 70 years. We are not there yet. We're about a third of the way there. So that's the expression that needs to be the focus of most of these fusion companies. So let's look at this, this expression term by term. The first term is the fusion rate. That is the number of fusion reactions occurring per square foot inside the plasma volume. And it's a function of the density of the temperature of the time, like I said. Um, it's also a function of chain reactions. If you can get a fusion event to cause a secondary fusion event, um, that improves improves that overall term. And it also is a function of the volume, like the overall volume of plasma. If there's more plasma fusing, you're getting more energy out of the entire reactor. This focus on triple product has become, I would call it an obsession in the fusion world, in the academic and government funded world. People focused on triple product for decades. And it just became, hey, let's get the highest triple product possible. And let's ignore all these other things like cost and the amount of concrete and the maintenance and the magnets we use and the neutron loading and all these other issues that you would think about if you were trying to build a commercial power plant. So the, this fusion focus, this triple focus has been an issue. And as you can see on the right, we've made a lot of progress towards triple product. But now as we move to a commercial industry, we've started to think about things beyond just how dense, how hot, and how long a plasma is held in a fusion reactor. Okay, so the second term is conduction. And conduction, as I said, is any time plasma touches something a wall, a magnet, a, um, a buttress, a structural component, a probe, a camera, um, a Langmuir probe, um, the, the, the bottom of the reactor, anytime it touches something, the plasma is conducted away because it's a charged particle, it goes into the metal, it's conducted away. And what happens is it steals energy as it leaves, okay? So it's, that's how you lose energy, and that, that hurts you overall. So the goal is to keep the stuff hot and in there. Don't let it escape. Don't let it touch the surface. And that leads to a number of design principles. You want to have space around your plasma. You don't want the plasma close to a wall or a magnet or a surface. You want to have plasma have the ability to recirculate recirculate with freedom of movement without touching anything. This is core to Todd Ryder's PhD thesis in the 1990s. And he opens his PhD thesis and he says up front, recirculation might be the key to getting to net power. 
recirculation is really important. You want to have material just move around without hitting anything. And the fields drive this because the fields control where the plasma goes, the electric field, the, uh, the magnetic field, those two fields, plasma will follow that, those fields like cars on the highway. They will corkscrew around those fields and follow them wherever they go. So you want to have your fields not run into walls, okay? Because th that'll be a leak point material will flow out of your machine that way. You'll lose power. And then finally, if you, you stick a probe in there, that's great. You just got to under, understand that the probe put, uh, is a possible leak point. Material could touch it. It could leave. Um, so for instance, where systems where the magnets were right up next to the plasma, like the Lockheed Martin approach, they actually put electric charges on the struts and the magnets themselves to try to keep the plasma out of there. It was a mitigating strategy. The goal is to keep material in there without losing it. Okay. And then of course there's radiation. Now, I don't have exact numbers, but I would guess that radiation is a lower um, loss mechanism than conduction. But in any case, whenever you have a hot plasma, it is radiating light, okay? And there's multiple plasma behaviors that underpin this. Um, for example, an ion whipping around an electron and slowing down, or an ion bumping into another ion and losing some energy that way. That energy leaves us light. So Bremstrom radiation, synchrotron radiation, cyclotron radiation, and other mechanisms create light. And just like the sun, as the, as the plasma gets hotter, more and more light emerges. And that light comes out as UV, IR, visible, X-ray, whatever. The entire plasma is bleeding energy away as light all the time. And so the ideal fusion reactor wouldn't do that at all. The ideal fusion reactor would be pitch black because it wouldn't radiate any energy as light. It wouldn't lose power that way. Um, people have toyed with various weird, goofy ideas like light reflection, of course, it, things like that, x-ray reflection or, or visible light reflection to try to keep that energy in the reactor core. That sort of thing is kind of playing on the edges. It's a marginal effect. It's not really going to help you. You might get 1% or less sort of minor advantages to that. But anyway, it's important to understand radiation is, a, is an issue. And there's plenty of theoreticians that will argue that certain concepts just fundamentally won't work because the radiation is so high um, that you lose power too much that way. And then you can't get power from the other terms in this expression. So anyway, radiation, avoid it. Okay, and then the final term is efficiency, okay? And a lot of the innovations that we see in the fusion startups nowadays have some innovation that fits on in this category. So for instance, the Commonwealth Fusion Systems Magnet Technology greatly improves the efficiency of the power plant, the overall efficiency. It also plays into the other terms, the conduction term and the fusion term, but it's an efficiency driver. Zap Energy's shear flow stabilization technique improves the overall efficiency of the machine because it reduces the instabilities that destroy the fusion rate. So uh, Helion has this exotic fuel cycle that it's patented that uh, incorporates helium-3 and a variety of other um, mechanisms so it's not just a straight mechanism it's got a secondary mechanism that they patented that's an efficiency driver real to fusion they're looking at they have an innovative capture approach that uses direct conversion that's an efficiency driver and then eczemer energy they also have a laser efficiency uh play they're going to improve their laser plasma approach now you will you may ask does this expression apply to ife i argue that it would because when you're doing fusion in an imploding capsule you still have fusion rates you still have conduction you still have radiation um yeah so yeah efficiency it's an important term all right i want to change gears and talk about hoaxes um if you're an investor people are going to approach you with wild ideas um I've been in this space now 16 years. I've seen a lot of stuff. I've been out to a lot of garages and mini storages and people's homes where people are doing different things with fusion. Um, one of the hallmarks of a hoax is the innovator or team 
is excessively secretive. I see that a lot. The two kind of go hand in hand. So if you meet someone that has you sign a whole bunch of excessive NDAs and then they have some secret um, laboratory or some secretive team or they're very closed off, that's usually a red flag, usually. Um, a lot of times people that are ambitious that want to do fusion, they have this personal fear that what they're doing isn't innovative enough. And so their whole personality can be built around doing something cool and innovative, but they kind of keep it hidden, right? That's an important part of it. I'm, I, I, the, more, the longer I've been in this game, the more and more I've moved towards teams, communities, groups of people. You know, just for example, nobody would ever claim that they could put somebody on the moon by themselves, okay? You wouldn't expect some dude in a garage to put a man on the moon. And that's kind of what fusion power is. It's that big of a problem that it's not going to be done by one person or a group of small people. It's going to be done by lots of people working together in big groups. And so I'm, I'm very, I trying to stay away now from people that are doing it solo. Another red flag is that a concept hasn't been published in open literature. Um, you know, to be fair to people, sometimes you want to hold back. I get that. Uh, there's one great example. Lockheed Martin spent many, many years and lots and lots of money, and they have not yet published, as far as I know, they haven't yet published in an open literature. But I want we want to see stuff in open literature because, to be frank, usually what happens is you work 10 years on an approach, you hit a dead end that you can't solve. And because you didn't publish it, because you didn't put it out in the world, there's no one else around to pick up your work because none of the other teams, none of the other academ academic groups, none of the other national labs was, was able to follow your work. So you, I want to see this stuff in open literature. Another category of stuff is um, approaches based off limited plasma effects that have to be scaled up to fusion reactor conditions. So this is, there's a lot of examples of this. Um, where you see something cool in, say, another area of physics, like um, mass spec or in electronics or power engineering or some other, maybe quantum mechanics, for example. You see something really cool, an interesting paper. You pick it up and you say, huh, I could take that effect and build a whole fusion reactor around it, okay? But what tends to happen in that situation is when you try to scale up, you introduce four, five, six, seven other physical effects that destroy what you're trying to do. So when you get to fusion reactor regime or operating space, you find out that the effect that you want to have happen is no longer strong enough to overcome the seven other things that are also happening. You get more bad behavior, more of what you hate and less of what you love in terms of beautiful fusion plasma physics behavior. So that's another issue. Um, approaches based on beam beam or beam target systems. So I've got a whole lecture on this called bad ideas, so I won't go into too much detail, but generally speaking, beam beam approaches don't work. When you fire a beam and another beam, there's a lot of fundamental issues there. Uh, keeping the beams coherent is very difficult getting them to move from point A to point B. You have to spend a lot of energy to make that happen. And, and also the scattering reactions are about a hundred to a thousand times more common than that collision that does fusion, that beautiful collision that does fusion. So this is why most fusion reactors tend to be big bulk plasmas where you have millions and millions and millions of particles bouncing off each other because a certain percentage of them are only going to do fusion. So big vats of particles bouncing off each other. That tends to be where the industry or where these concepts tend to head. Finally, there's the wrong kind of neutrons. This is an important one to understand. Um, there's a famous example from the 1950s where England, the, the country of England, measured neutrons from their Zeta fusion reactor. And they went back and evaluated them and realized they were the wrong kind of neutrons. You can get neutrons from beam 
went from a, a beam of ions slamming into a metal wall can sometimes kick up some neutrons. And people read that and say, oh, we did fusion because neutrons occurred. Neutrons are the currency of fusion. Everyone brags about how many they made, for how long, at what rate, blah, blah, blah. But you can have the wrong kind of neutrons. And generally, the wrong kind of neutrons, are they're cold or they're the wrong kind of energy because there's a specific energy spread from thermonuclear fusion reactions. Um, they're also directional. They tend to, if you have a, a whole fleet of um, detectors and you see the neutrons hitting one set of detectors, there's a directional beam to it. And that actually happened in a famous paper in 2012 from a fusion startup, which I will not mention here, but they claimed that they had gotten fusion. And if you look at their paper, you can see directional neutrons. So it's the wrong kind. Or, and they might be cold as well. Um, so for instance, the fusion startup, or First Light Fusion, um, last year they had to work with the UK AEA to really prove that they had measured the right kind of neutrons. So they had to work very closely, and that's ultimately what the UK AEA paper validated, was that it was the right kind of neutrons from a thermonuclear fusion event. The reason why this is important is that thermonuclear fusion events will scale up as you improve the density, the temperature, the time, the volume, other processes do not scale up. They just simply don't scale up. So one will scale, the other won't. And that's why this is an important distinction. There's also been some hoaxes. I've seen some people that have claimed you can get fusion chain reactions through some other mechanism that's unknown or new to science, basically. Um, and I won't say that they're wrong. I will not say that because, you know, there's certainly things that have been unexplored. But I will say that the consensus within the, the fusion community is there are two really good ways to get chain reactions. The concept is known as ignition in the IFE, ICF community, which is what National Ignition Facility did back in uh, the end of last year. Big deal, big announcement, big event. In the tokamak community, this is known as a burning plasma. And ITER is being built specifically in France to get a burning plasma. Now, normally when a fusion event occurs, hydrogen, hydrogen fuel is they make helium. The helium is so freaking hot that it just exits, okay? Normally, typically. It's not always true. I mean, there's a lot of nuance there, but generally speaking, it's just so hot that it exits. In fact, in some modeling codes, that's in fact what they do. They have a fusion event and then they, they treat the product as gone, basically. Um, chaining in ignition or burning plasma, in both cases, what they're trying to do is keep that hot byproduct around long enough to bump into something else and drop its energy. Okay, they want it to redeposit that energy back in the plasma so that it spurs on this secondary fusion event. Chaining events are, are really exciting because they suddenly boost the amount of energy that comes out of the reactor. You see this plot here on the right, which shows Livermore's 10 year odyssey to get ignition and you see all the power and then you see that ignition shot way over on the far right. That's the kind of boost that you see when you get ignition. So it's a really exciting thing. And it's worth pointing out that it's the fundamentally different than the conventional nuclear industry. A fission plant that we've had for decades and decades and decades relies on fission chain reactions. In fact, the whole fission plant itself is built to moderate and control the chaining event that's occurring naturally so that it, it yields steady, stable, constant power. Fusion, you have to work much, much harder to get that chain event to occur. And NIF's 10-year odyssey shows how complicated this is. Um, effectively, Liver Livermore had to throw out the leading theories that they had for what ignition was. So just... Just to provide some color for that, back in the 1990s, John Lindell, who was a big time physicist at Livermore, wrote this very long book um, and paper and wrote a wonderfully thorough paper that covered ignition. And he laid out the whole campaign and why ignition was going to occur and everything else. And, you know, he was going to win the Nobel Prize for that. Well, it didn't work out that way. Um, when Livermore was turn turned on NIF, in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, they weren't able to get ignition 
as they expected. And their, the team had to effectively throw out all the leading theories and focus on a data-driven experimental approach, which is just a wonderful way to do any science. So you do an experiment, you, you make a change, you see an improvement, and then you sort of follow your nose and step slowly through by improving the experimental conditions to get better and better and better data. And that's what led to the ignition shot. So it was a, it was a change. And that just shows how hard it is to get chain reactions to occur. Okay, so thank you for your time. I'm just going to wrap this up. Um, I do believe that net power is likely within the next five to 10 years. I, I think it's going to come from one of the startups. Um, Eater will turn on, so that's going to be exciting too. We'll see what happens there. Um, right now, our industry is really white hot in terms of money. A lot of investors want to jump in. There's a lot of interest, a lot of in interest from existing organizations. The problem is we just don't have enough people. We're currently rate limited by the number of qualified people that can just fill these jobs. So we need educational institutions to step up to provide a, t a pipeline of qualified people for these roles. There's just not enough people that understand fusion. I mean, who learns fusion in school? Nobody. Nobody learns it. Um, superconductors are a game changer for the field. If you add a superconductor to a machine, it changes the fusion rate, probably, likely. In a lot of schemes, that's how it works. It also allows the machine to run longer and improves the efficiency. It improves the overall plasma control. I think they're going to be a big part of our industry. Lawson's expression, I went over that. It gives us clues to how a reactor should be designed because the goal is to make the power balance positive and that's the fundamental physics that you want to explore there's going to be hoaxes there have been hoaxes there are hoaxes there will be hoaxes um it's important to educate everyone with okay thank you very much bye